a reminder that we are live streaming. And if you've got questions later, we do very much encourage you to drop the questions down as you go along. Patrick will probably approach you or repeat your question because we've got to remember we've got lots of colleagues joining us from who knows where via the live stream. So Patrick, over to you. First thing I'm going to do is just double check that I've got the microphone on for the on. Yes, I have for the online folks. Right. So the first thing you'll notice is that it's unlikely my name is Caroline. Um, it's, it's possible, but um, I'm actually Patrick Dunn. Um, Caroline, unfortunately, is ill, so I've stepped in at the last moment to take her presentation. I, I know the presentation quite well. I've gone through it. And interestingly, I wonder if Caroline, I wonder if she's watching now. I actually disagree with one small part of it. So, that, you know, a lot of learning is about disagreement and contradiction. So um, that's probably a good thing. So um, just about me, I've been doing learning technology project, uh, projects for about 40 years, actually, as of next month. I did my first one in uh, uh, 1983. Um, and I do a lot of academic work as well. I've got three master's degrees as well. So um, this is what we're talking about. Um, just briefly about um, UFI. We support the development of digital technologies that help us obtain vocational skills. We're about vocational skills, okay? Um, and as a charity, we have a particular focus on this kind of learner, those who haven't done particularly well or been served particularly well by mainstream education. Now, of course, defining mainstream education is a pretty important thing here. And I, I kind of struggled with it this morning. So I just came up with this phrase, um, didn't do particularly well at school, that kind of thing. Um, or didn't go to school. And if you look at the stats, they're pretty shocking, actually. Um, I was looking at the, the literacy stats this morning, and there's about 7 million people uh, in the UK classed as, I think it's illiterate or pure uh, or, 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 or with difficulty with literacy age, I think eight or nine reading age, some, something like that. So, you know, you think about wandering around your average shopping centre, the number of people that walk in past you that can't actually read the, the signs on the shops or the packaging, there's a lot, actually. Um, so they're the folks that have not been particularly served well by the traditional mainstream. OK, so the next bit is a bit of audience um, interaction. Let me just see if I've got it right. Yeah. Um, and as we've got, we've got a select audience here today, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and so what I was going to ask was, um, do you or do any of you um, have a sense that, that there was a particular aspect of the mainstream education system that didn't serve you well? Um, do you know anyone? I mean, just to give you an example, my my partner. Do you know what? I promised I wouldn't mention her specifically, but I did. I'm going to go somewhere else. Okay, now I'm going to go somewhere else completely as well. Um, uh, a friend of my son's um, uh, has got a real hang up about maths. He'll never get maths GCSE. It's, it, he, just, he just can't do it. And he has a sense, and his parents keep telling him, that it's going to be a hindrance in his life. And I, I think this is the wrong, you know, it's a wrong bit of parenting, but also um, it's one of these things that you do come across. A, a number of adults have a hang up about a particular subject. It's often maths. Um, and it can be all sorts of things. You know, the I'm just going to get out of the way briefly so that we can all see. Um, so, you know, it can just be the sense that you're a square peg in a round hole or you just lack motivation or for goodness sake, the pandemic, you know, neurodiversity, lack of support, learning you might just not fit and there's a hell of a lot of people that don't fit um I was very lucky didn't come from a privileged background but I, I was fine all the way through but I know loads of people who just got one of those you know and if you know someone just reflect on it if folks online the same um and there can be all sorts of reasons for those. Um, the categories I've got here are situational, institutional, or dispositional. I really like those. So it could be something to do with the situation you're in. Um, it could be simply who you are, your disposition, or it could be the institutional situation that you're in. Okay. Um, so there's all sorts of reasons. Um, forgive me, I do have to go through these notes because um, this is a great presentation, but you know, Caroline wrote the script. So let's have a look at the human element, because what we're saying here, and essentially what we're talking about here is design, designing for those whom the educational, the, the mainstream education system has not done a fantastic job, and how we can design for learning technologies to help them out. And I really like this diagram as a 
a series of zones, a series of uh, concentric circles that puts the learner right at the center. Now, the point here is because, of course, you're always supposed to put the learner at the center, aren't you? That's what you're supposed to do when you're designing learning experiences. You're supposed to say, we put the learner at the center. But when you have learners, students who are from, for, for, for whatever reason, um, not fitting in, not well served, there are some special conditions here. So, for example, um, the learner may be particularly, um, uh, they may they may not be very good at expressing their needs, articulating what they need, um, what they want, and so on, their direction, where they want to go. Um, it's a different perspective that's required. Now, all these other folks, due to support peers, experts, and they'll be much more articulate, much more articulate, and much more able to uh, to manage the situation, but putting the learner at the core here can be tough, all right? And so it requires a particularly astute and occasionally forensic approach to design, which I'll talk about, um, to make sure that they are well served. So having had a look at who the sort of the human, the human bit, now let's look at the design process. It's worth saying that my my sort of passion in life is is design so I'm really pleased that Caroline wrote this bit in um I worked in a couple of design agencies I was so obsessed by it um and what we've got here is a fairly well-known cartoon that says um and this isn't particularly about learning design this is about design in general it says okay let, let's say we're designing something from a customer for a customer the customer wanted a tire on a piece of rope hanging on a tree now, the client didn't describe that right. So they sort of got the hanging bit and the rope bit right. But actually, from their point of view, it looked like a swing. The engineer thought, aha, I'm going to have two bits of rope on a vertical part of the, the trunk. And then the man manufacturer did what the engineer said. And so you, so you got this chain of misunderstanding. And a chain of misunderstanding is extremely dangerous and damaging where you've got a learner who hasn't been served well anyway because their experience is not going to be great. So this is what it kind of looks like. The learner says, well, how, how do I know what I need? You know, I know what I don't like, and I don't like what I've usually been told and how I've usually been educated. The well-meaning professional wanders around shows and conferences like this and says, do you know what? I heard this cool thing. I, I, the this, this sales guy said, oh, why don't you use bloody blah, blah technology or design solution? The project manager says, okay, great, we'll do that. I've drawn up a budget. And the IT person says, do you know what? VR is great. I no one told me not to use VR. I'm doing a session partly based around VR this afternoon. Um, so so we have a, we have a chain, chain of problems here. Now, the key thing here is we must talk about impact. And this is something that we at UFI are very driven by. And I quite like this phrase. It says, until your learners learn something, I don't like the spelling of learnt, though. Um, you have no evidence that your design and technology are effective or have impact. OK, until your learner has changed. Again, I talk a lot about that this afternoon. And until your learner has changed, you haven't got any evidence that you've had any impact. All right. So that's what we have to talk about. Our problem at the moment is that technology is advancing so rapidly and so unpredictably. Um, that it's hard to track where we are. And we also, we live in an unsta unstable society, politically, economically. And I, I have a slight hang up with the word transition. We're not in transition because we're changing forever now, right? We're not going from one state to another, we're changing forever. And in a situation like this, technology is, found, well, technology is a subset of the second point, isn't it? Um, the un unstable society, the cultural change, um, is, is a function of technology, but it's also, it's also uh, technology is also a subset. Okay, so how do we, uh, actually, this is the bit I slightly disagree with. Carol, um, Caroline's got this thing here that says, right, um, her perspective is that um, humans don't like constant change, right? So our problem is that if we're designing for people who are badly served, what we'd like to do is to say, this is what we're familiar with, this is how we plan for the future. And here's the structure whereby we can design for them. OK, now I actually think human beings are on a spectrum here of change. Oh, wait, I think we've got another audience person coming in. Do come in. Hi there. Yeah, no worries at all. I, I'll, try, I'll just do a quick, quick recap. Um, 
I will do a mega quick recap. So what we're talking about is that. We're talking about those with who haven't been particularly well served by the mainstream, putting them at the center of the design uh, uh, process. We talked about a rather flawed design process in which assumptions drive poor design and the fact that those badly served by the mainstream education system need a particularly astute and almost forensic approach to design. And now I've just been talking about an unstable world in which everything changes. And uh, what I was just saying was that actually, I think in terms of human response to change, you've got a spectrum. And at one end, you've got folks that absolutely dread it. And at the other, you've got people like me who love it. Right. And so we have to, and the thing about innovation and change is you need a mix of people, right? If you all, if you've got loads of people like me, we mess things up. If you've got loads of people who only like stable states, you don't innovate. So you need a mix of people to design a process. Okay. Um, so we go on to design thinking. Now you may or may not be familiar with these. There's the, um, the, the, the left-hand one is called the double diamond. Um, interestingly, it's, it's got its 20th birthday this year. It was developed 20 years ago by the Design Council. It's a very simple process. I think, to be honest, it's a process from a slightly different time, but as a way of thinking, it's useful. And what it says is, there was an academic in the 90s, and I've completely forgotten his name, who, who came up with this concept that design is about the journey out and the journey in. The journey out and the journey in. So what you do is you diverge. You diverge from the point of a challenge, and then you and then you, you examine the nature of that challenge and then you converge towards an understanding of what you're dealing with. OK, you then say, right, what are we going to deliver? And so you go out and in again. And I think this is this is great as a principle. I think it's 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 symptomatic of a time where things were a bit more stable. Yeah, do you see what I mean? Because you, you diverge from a point by the time you've got to the convergence again, everything's changed. Right. Which is why I like the cyclical one. Yeah. So the idea is you whiz around this circle. You go, right, what do we understand? I empathize with my problem. I define it. I iterate. I'm deliberately speaking very quickly because often this cycle is very quick. I ideate, I prototype, I test, I implement. All right. And then you spin around again and you spin around again. Yeah. Until you get to the point where you've tested, you've prototyped, you've messed about, frankly. This can be very messy, which is why you need people who are not entirely stable state people until you've got to a point where your understanding is developed and you've experimented and at that point you can implement, okay? Um, so the key, the key thing though is design thinking. You've got to be aware of how you're thinking about design, particularly, and forgive me if I'm repeating myself, particularly where you, you're dealing with people who have not been well served and for whom the design process has to be astute, astute almost to the point of being um, forensic. So approaches. You start by identifying the problem you're trying to fix. And I want to come back to that in a second, particularly for the context of this conference. How do you involve the learner in the design process? And then how do you remain flexible and responsive? And I've got a, this, a sort of question 3A that popped into my head this morning, which is how do you keep an open mind? Yeah, it's not just about being flexible and responsive, because you can be respect, res, flexible and responsive, but to not have a particularly open mind. That, that's a little bit contradictory, but anyway. Um, I wanna go back to the first one though. What's the problem you're trying to fix? So who, who in this room would describe themselves as involved in HE? Ah, that's interesting. So do you, def all three? Oh, okay, brilliant. So um, hands up online audience. How many of you are involved in HE? Oh, yeah, right, okay. Um, so the point here is, do you identify within higher education the concept of a problem. Do, do, do you see what I mean? So you're in front of a bunch of students and you're looking at them and saying, are you a problem? Well, of course, students are often a problem, but not in the way we're talking about, okay? So, so in the vocational sphere where we, we work, we often start with a very, you know, a, a profound problem, don't we? You know, we have people, no, I'm gonna disappear into detail. I'll come back to that later. Well, in HE, you don't tend to identify, tend to start with a, a problem, okay? So we may have to have another bit of vocabulary, another term for that, which is potentially a starting state. It's not a problem, but it's a, it's a starting point, isn't it? So if you're trying to, and I'm deliberately, start, I'm deliberately gonna use a subject which is not vocational, and I hope I'm, I'm not stumbling or offending anyone here, philosophy, yeah? 
do you start a course on philosophy by thinking, oh my goodness me, we've got a problem here? No, you don't. You say, here's a starting point. I have a bunch of folks that are just starting a, a, a qualification, and at the end, they will be different. So, so in this case, it's not problem, uh, solution, it's start point, end point. I, I just thought I'd sort of talk a little bit about that. So what's the problem you're trying to fix, or what's your starting point? Um, so the thing here is that um, the point at which you start has to be defined by um, a number of stakeholders. Um, we've got the same map again there. You must make sure that your understanding of and you're listening to the voice of the learner is, 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 is responsive to the various stakeholders. And it can be quite tricky to get to the, 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 the voice of the learner. There's no point in building a solution if you're trying to fix um, the wrong thing, if you're not actually listening to the learner astutely enough. You will often find that some of the other stakeholders have very different agendas. So, for example, they might start by saying, um, well, this is all interesting, but um, it's too expensive. Right. That's a very important thing to 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 include in the um, in the in the in the debate, in the investigation. But the the the, the um, comparison of viewpoints, the second bullet down is extremely important. The checking of assumptions is extremely important. The reaching of consensus can be profoundly difficult, given the diversity of, of viewpoints. And so to involve the learner in the design process and, uh, process and remain flexible, you have, and I really like this diagram, I wish I'd come up with it. Um, you have th this concept of, a, you know, this mindset and a toolkit. And I think they're both really important. Um, the mindset uh, involves things like checking assumptions. I talk about that a lot. I think Again, I'm going to put my foot in it here. Um, I think those of us who've done, who've, who are inverted commas educated, I think we make a lot of assumptions about things, don't we? You know, it's much easier to, to be fixed in your assumptions if um, you've, you've studied a lot, you've, you've, you've really thought about things. I, I have put my foot in it, haven't I? Anyway, um, mindset, building trust, empathizing, find the motivation, find the motivation of the learner. What do they need? OK, so there's various aspects of mindset. And again, I really like the tools on the right. Personas, we, we show what personas are, the characterizations of, of people, categorizations. We did a really interesting uh, piece of research with the RSA in which we looked at um, why adults don't kind of fill their lives full of learning. Why don't adults keep learning? OK, and we identified, I think it was six or was it five personas? Marin? I can't remember. I think it's six personas. Um, and we looked at the characteristic of each of these types of ind individual and, and what stopped them from learning. And they range from, you know, frankly, your Amazon driver who doesn't have time and doesn't believe they have the slightest chance of, of learning anything. Um, and I think we I think we called that the functional learner. Um, and then there was the sort of um, I'm not going to recall this very well, but um, um, there, there are learners around who, who simply um, they would like to, but um, they don't believe that they're a learning type. You know, they don't believe they're the kind of person. And then the whole, whole bunch of things. So personas is a great tool. Uh, learner journey mapping. I like that one. Um, using agile approaches. We're familiar with those. Again, it's very similar to the design cycle, the design thinking cycle that we had a couple of slides ago. Um, so iterative agile processes. And excuse me. So just a few examples of our work. Um, the, 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 key, the key thing here is that each of these deal with, um, I'm trying to avoid the word underprivileged, with, with these learners who haven't done well in inverted commas, right? And they take really very different approaches. The one I know best is First Step Trust. It's a remarkable organization that takes individuals who've had the most appalling lives and it just gives them a chance, you know? It gives them a chance to learn really basic things like how to fit a tire on a car. And the reason it does that is because the people they deal with, with their really, really dreadful starting points, totally believe they can't learn. They can't learn anything, right? 
And it gives them a process whereby they develop self-esteem and they say to themselves, do you know what, if I can learn to stick a tire on a car, actually that's quite complicated and it's a bit risky and it's effortful, maybe I can learn something else, right? Um, so it's, a, it's partly a virtual reality project, um, but one of my real sort of high, one of my, um, uh, one of my insights, one of the light bulbs that switched on for me was, in a way, it's not just about the virtual reality. It's about that point where someone who not long ago, um, I'm not going to go into the details, you know, was living a very dangerous uh, and, and impoverished life. Someone puts a headset on them and the world they're seeing is damn sight better than the one they live in, right? And they can do something in it. They have a functional activity they can actually achieve. And they go through a process and they think, blimey, if I can do this and someone cares for me enough to do this, then I can learn other stuff as well, right? And that is profoundly putting the learner at the center of the design process, thinking about what their needs are. They did a huge amount of research and conversation with these people. They got to know them really well. Um, and, it, and it worked, you know? Now, the other projects I know less well, um, I think the, the NeuroCare one is interesting. Um, the whole development process was, um, it's, it's, for, it's for care workers. The whole development process was built around um, uh, conversations, focus groups, discussions with, uh, with, with the care workers. And the solution they came up with was very human-centered videos, just examples of how you should do the job. So it's not the most high-tech of solutions, but it's very much focused and designed around what they discovered about the learners that had, who had not been at all well-treated. Marion, by the way, if you do want to chip in and, you know, just sort of build on my understanding of, um, of these projects, that's, that, that'd be a good idea. Um, we have Matt's Kitchen talked about maths at the start with, and I didn't mention my partner. Um, so teachers make a lot of assumptions about levels of numeracy, and there's a, a kind of, um, I don't know, there's sometimes a tacit assumption, a, 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 an inner voice with a number of people that just said, I don't like maths, I hate maths. And so what the, what the, the designers here did was they kind of unpicked this whole um, this whole uh, assumption, this, this um, self-perception that um, maths wasn't, wasn't for them and develop some kind of assessment, uh, adaptive assessment, which allowed people to succeed little by little um, to the point where the, the, the person taking the assessment thought, do you know what, I can do some of this. And as they were doing the assessment, it actually measured where they were so that when they started the, the sort of the learning bit, they knew where to start and they were confident they could start. So. That is the end of the main bit of the presentation. Um, and I've been slightly surprised by an extra slide there. Do excuse me. Ah, here we go. So um, learning technologies can help and they've got more chance of creating impact when the design process is problem and learner focused. I've kept saying that. I really like the mindset and toolbox slide. I will obsess endlessly about agility and iteration. You know, when I talk about people that need a stable state, I frankly don't think they're very good at ad being agile and iterative, all right? This is why you need a mix in a, in a design team. You need a mix of stable state and agitators disruptive. You really do. Um, and I really like the honesty, open, you know, and, and collaborative approach. You remember that, that the circle diagram with the heart in the middle. Um, there are lots of stakeholders. You've got to be honest, you've got to be open, you've got to be clear about what your position is and you've got to collaborate. Any questions? Or comments or thoughts? And thank you again for Caroline, who I hope is watching, um, for a fantastic presentation. And it's been a real privilege to, to be her deputy, as it were. One more thing I was thinking that I think I totally agree about I love that. Can we go back to that lovely diagram? You know the one I mean. It's that. That's perfect. That's the one. Um, and it's such a teeny word, but it can be so so key to the process. Would you like to talk about trust and gaining learner learners' trust to actually take part in that process? Because it's not an easy thing, is it? Getting honest feedback from learners about what they want when sometimes they can't visualize it or 
in my experience, they're just like, oh heavens, why are they asking me? Mm. We're a little bit on, on the back foot. Mm. And how do we go about building that trusting relationship? What do you think? Um, okay, so the question was, how do we gain trust? How do we build trust with these people? I think often you've got the teacher is a great gatekeeper. So if you've got to teach a moderator, mm. you know, we, we see lots of stories about, you know, I'm, I'm going to say Ofsted coming in. Mm. The teacher leaves and Ofsted start firing questions at the students. And then you've got this person has to suit on them to record. And they will immediately clam up or give the answers that they think person wants to hear. Mm, mm. So I think you've actually maybe got student councils you can draw. Yeah, yeah. Certainly having a familiar person, mm. but may, maybe even smaller focus groups. Mm. I don't know, mm. but it, it certainly can be difficult because I've certainly got a bit of pushback of why are they asking me? Yeah. And teacher as expert. Mm. And it, does this mean you don't know what you're doing if you're asking me what I should what you should do instead? <laughs> do you know it's interesting when you said a trusted person what occurred to me because of course what I, the reason i batted it back to you was because i needed time to think um so so my experience with first step trust it's a remarkable organization what what they have done to gain trust is they found one or two people who represent them so you find one person who's had a dreadful life and you gain their trust you just find one and you work with them and it doesn't matter how long you take you work with them. That person can then gain the trust of everyone else. Do you, do you see what I mean? You don't want somebody like me to go in and say, hey, man, what's your problem? Right. Um, what you want. Cheers. Thanks for coming. What you want is to is to cultivate an ambassador, yes. don't you? And that works. That works. Yeah. And something that, that Ronnie Wilson remarked, Ronnie Wilson, MBE, First Step Trust, amazing bloke. Um, something he's done is he has worked with particular individuals sometimes i think it might be years to gain to gain their trust um and fa and you get this thing you know people like me all of a sudden yeah and they advocate and he's done that brilliantly um so so that i think that's one way of doing it um i do like the idea of focus groups but i wouldn't even call them focus groups i just say i just say group chats you know as in as in face to face group chats you know that works otherwise any other thoughts on gaining gaining trust I think one of the things that you mentioned, all of these things take time, and I think people don't allocate that time that yeah. energy is in yeah. mm. to build yeah. the trust. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Lynn just said parachute in. You don't want to parachute in. Yeah. That's that's for sure. That's for sure. Burgers, possibly in coffee. Burgers and coffee. Yeah. Say it again? Pizza parties. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you're a student at any level, you're 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 already gonna have a if you feel like you've been failed and you're struggling with learning, you're already gonna have a bit of a distrust, like this might not be for me, this isn't, you know, and people don't care. Mm -hmm. So it does, you know, have it does require like educators, teachers, whoever is involved in that process to be willing to dedicate the time and showcase, no, I'm here to help. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's yeah. a, a very big one. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, thank you. Yeah, no, I'll just chuck this in. Dr. Christina Donovan is now at Edgewood University. Her doctoral thesis and her continuing work is on the bond of trust between the educator and students. Oh, that's so interesting. She's a fantastic person to read on that. Okay. On trust. Now, I'm just going to. Thank you so much. Uh, there's only one person plus us here for the whole <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm also, we are also promoting. Um, the what's this called, Maureen? It's the, the, oh, it's the it's the VocTech Future Skills Award 2023. The VocTech Future Skills Award 2023. If you could make one change to the skill system to get more adults learning, what would it be? What would it be? There is five thousand quid in it for you. Yeah, it's worth thinking about, isn't it? And it's a good question. Great question. Yeah. What would you do to get more adults learning? Yeah. And what I like about it is it's a very open question, isn't it? Learning what? Learning when? Learning how? How are we going to get more people involved? So thank you very much. Thank you very much, folks online. I think that is probably it. Um, you can get a copy of these slides. Um, do sign up to our newsletter. 
Um, and I think that's it. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for viewing. Thank you. Well, hopefully you caught it at the end, and, and you can. Well, I, I don't know, Pat, Patrick, are you dashing off? Are no. You, should we do a Should we do a compressed version? If you could just start from the beginning, just do that. Like, <laughs> each session has like a little half-hour block, but then this one is like on its own on a half-hour block. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Okay.
Um, I didn't I didn't do this. I didn't construct this, by the way. I'm sorry for the I, I'm actually standing in for someone else. So I can say this is brilliant without being arrogant. Right. Um, so we talked about mindset and these kind of things in the mindset that are um, that are very important. And I particularly build on. I, sorry, I particularly alight on building trust. Thank you, Lynn. Um, and not making assumptions. And then I, we talked a bit about personas, um, impact measures, agile approaches. So the idea of you know, tools and ways of thinking. And then I gave some examples and I endlessly talk about the wonderful First Step Trust who deal with very disadvantaged, deprived individuals and give them the chance to start. That's it. They, they, they know their people and they give them a very first simple experience to get them started and encourage them how to learn. And that's it.